Welcome back to 755 is Real. I'm David O'Brien, Brazer Rider for The Athletic. I'm with my co-host, Eric O'Flaherty. What's up, Eric? What's up, Dave? Man, I got a lot better lighting today for some reason. I picked up the lamp and put something, I put my checkbook underneath it, and look at that. Right? Got, like, One of those lights here. behind you burn out. Uh, maybe that's it. I think there was too much lighting behind me. <laughs> Probably because I've left them on for like 24 hours a day since I've been here. Like yeah. I leave the TVs on and everything else. <laughs> figure I ain't paying for it, you know? You are paying for it. But I'm not paying for electricity. Yeah. It's probably <laughs> built in. With the with the way these hotels down here are gouging right now with spring yeah. break going on. You're my God, it. man. It's unbelievable, dude, what they're paying for mediocre hotels, what you're paying. Let's just put it this way. To stay in a really mediocre base Hope Marriott like property or whatever down here, I'm paying uh, more to, to stay here in the middle of Venice and Podunk, Florida, that I'm going to be paying in ga the Gaslamp District in San Diego in three weeks. Wow. How about that? They could do what they want, I guess. Yeah, they can. They got to, yeah. It's packed, too. There's a lot of Braves actually staying here. Is it really? Yeah. I just saw uh, McHugh just walk through the lobby. Uh, I was in a weight room the other day. There's a weight room right by the door. And the other day, Darno's walking out, going to the, He stopped and was looking in. I was like, who's this freak looking at me? And I realized <laughs> it was it, Darno. He was does it have a fridge? He was screwing with me. Huh? Does it have a fridge or a little oven in there? What? My room? Yeah. Some yeah. of those like courtyard type of rooms have. Yeah, uh, it's got a, a fridge. Most hotels have yeah. fridges now. Yeah. They don't yeah, have a fridge. Have I have that little one, oven man. in there, little microwave and stuff. You can... <laughs> microwave. Not a hot plate. You're in a bad yeah. hotel. It's got a hot plate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, it's got a microwave. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty basic now. Hotels stop putting the mini bars, except for the hotels you got the team staying. You know, they're, they're in like the Ritz Carlton and shit. They still got mini bars in those because they know how people actually use them. Yeah, a lot of them are empty now, though. You, you open they them are. up, and, or they put the snacks on the table, and it's seventeen dollars for yeah. a pack of M and M's. Yeah, come they, home they, with a little buzz one night, run up a three hundred dollars, and candy they know bill. it. They know it. <laughs> How about when hotels do? And I think some still do it, but they were doing it for a while, where because people, I like me, would use the the a fridge which had a mini bar. You'd use the fridge to put like a Red Bull or something in there, or you might take their Red Bull and replace it because you were thirsty, you know, whatever. Auto charge. Take a beer out of there and replace it. Yeah, so if you shift it, it charges yep. you. Yep. <laughs> and then you're explaining to the front desk, I didn't drink anything. Yeah, and you like, you wind up just paying it because it's not worth the hassle. So if you had like a kid, if, you, if you're in your room with a little kid or something and he knocks oh, they'll <laughs> Kids will just go up there and yard sale the whole thing and cost you <laughs> 70 bucks right there. All right, buddy, you might as well eat the M&M's. So anyway, uh, here we are at spring training. And, dude, I got to tell you, man, that was the busiest five days in all the years I've covered baseball. We knew it was going to be really busy. And Alex made it frenetic. He wanted to get – he told us he wanted to get the roster done by Friday. They started on Monday, really doing deals. He wanted to get the roster done by Friday, and he got it done, man. He might add another piece, maybe a scrap heap starter or something. You know, like an Annabelle, they got him that year at the end. But he's got the big pieces are done, and he did it in five days. It, it was quick. impressive. Yeah. I, I think that the McHugh signing is pretty good, getting that bullpen deeper, and then obviously adding Kenley. I, I think they could use at least somebody to compete for one of those fourth or fifth starter spots and drive the guys just in case somebody comes into camp and falls on their face. You know, it, it's going to be tough to roll into, into the season with three guys you feel like you can really count on or four. But – they're looking pretty good overall. You know, I thought the same thing. I think they need to get, they could use another proven guy. But then I started thinking about the guys that they're looking at in the fourth and fifth spot. And you look at the last two years by comparison. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about Cal Wright, who pissed yep. his ass off in the postseason a couple of years ago. He's, he's one of, you're talking about Hawaskari Noah, who before he got hurt last year was literally their best pitcher. Yeah. He was pitching the best for a month before he got hurt. He's healthy now. He's penciled in for one of those if he pitches well. So that's two. They only got two spots open, obviously. Right. Then you got Kyle Muller, who last year for like three starts looked great. You got Tuki Toussaint. Again, three starts, just really inconsistent still. But he had, remember the starts that when he came in against San Diego and that start at Philly where he pitched his ass off? Yeah. So there's another one. Um, you got Tucker Davidson. Um, I mean, you got like five guys competing for two spots. Yeah, and, you, need, you need two of them to have a good camp to, right. to feel good about it. And you really – he he really is probably going to go with six out the gate because they got no off – they got a one-off day in the first, like, three or four yeah. weeks, you know. So 
They're probably going to go, and because guys have only got to have three weeks of spring training, they're probably going to go with a six starter. Yeah. But that's what was the brilliant thing about Alex is everybody was shocked when he did Kenley Jansen. Everybody thought he was done when he got McHugh. We're thinking, okay, they're five deep right now with that pin, and then you know five solid studs, and then then you add in mixing the guys, you know, you that you got younger guys, older guys, you mix in, but then you add the big piece, Kenley Jansen, that nobody was expecting. No, but then you start thinking about it, and you, Alex explains why. You start thinking about it. it did make a lot of sense for a lot of reasons. One last year, the Braves pitched in; they played into November. Right, they had a lot of guys pitch more innings than they've ever pitched. You yeah. got Charlie Morton coming back from a major injury to his leg, not getting a whole lot of time in spring training. He's going to make like three starts. Max Fried's going to make four spring training starts. He pitched more innings than he's ever pitched. Ian Anderson, he had a month off last year with that thing, so that probably works out well for him. But again, short spring, a short winter for those guys. Um, we just talked about how those last two spots, if they could have got like a Zach Grinky or somebody with a, at a reasonable price, they would have done it. When he right. couldn't do that, Alex made that decision. You know what we're going to do then? We're going to go double down on the bullpen. If we have to take a starter out in the second inning, they can do it now and not worry about killing their pin because they're literally going to be as deep as they were in 2020. If you need to use three guys today to get through it, three-year studs, you got three more tomorrow you can use. Yeah, and a lot of those young guys have options left. So if you had to pull one of them out of the pen, you right. know, maybe they're starting in two days, maybe they're not. You keep them ready. They have to go throw three or four innings for you out of the pen. You know, that's that's the unfortunate thing is they're probably getting sent down to make room for somebody else. But if they make a good impression, they'll be back. You know, they they have options to play with a lot yeah. of those guys. Um, and I, I don't think, I mean, you know, you'd never see a team have too much, too much talent in the pen where you can't find a way to get everybody in. You wind up just getting a chance to rest your your studs more. So, I mean, they're in a, they're in good shape. Yeah, we didn't even, I didn't even mention a guy like Jacob Webb. Yeah. Dylan Lee, who came up at the end last year, Spencer Strider, who made his debut in the last weekend, it throws fuck, just throws gas. He's got yeah. all, he's got his options. Um, I mean, you got a lot of guys that can fill those last couple spots in the pen because you're six deep with guys that are locks that are damn good. Yeah. I mean, you now you got Will Smith, so you got three lefties now. You got you got Matzik, who was maybe the best lefty in baseball last year. Yeah. You got AJ, and you got Will Smith, three lefty setup guys. Three from stars. The right, from the right, you've got McHugh, who was as good as any reliever last year, setup guy, right? One five five ERA for the Rays, can go three innings, did it last year a bunch. Might be a perfect guy to be your opener. He did that with Tampa Bay several times, nine times or something. So you got McHugh, Luke Jackson, and Kenley Jansen from the right side. Kenley obviously closing. If you got Kenley close, if Kenley closes, say three in a row, you're never going to need to use them four in a row. But even if you don't want to do four and five days, you got Will Smith, you got Matzik. I mean, you could just so many things he that Snick can do now with the lefty righty matchups and just giving guys rest. He's not going to have to wear any of these guys out, which is perfect given yeah. how little time they've got to get ready and how deep these guys, those relievers pitched a lot of innings last year. They did. And then 16 more games in a postseason where they used them heavily, the same three guys. Yeah. And you got a shorter, you know, you got a shorter spring training to build them up. You don't know if they're going to have time to go back to back or really push themselves. But the really, really nice thing about this pen is Matzik could close. You can't tell me he's not going to handle yep. it well. Jackson could close. You've seen yep. him do it. Jansen's a closer. Will Smith closed all McHugh year last can year. Close. McHugh could close. So, you know, if you if you wind up having to use three of your top guys out of the pen two, three nights in a row early and you know you yep. want to give them a day off and – you got two more closers on reserve at, yeah. at least guys you feel confident they can go out there and fill in when those guys are down. So, I mean, it's, we had a pen like that in 2010 when yeah. Billy, Billy went down, Billy was off a day. Saito was off a day. Well, guess what? You had Johnny and Craig ready to step in. Yeah. Um, so having that bullpen depth's huge. And, you know, a lot of teams stay away from make, you know, piling on to a strength, but I, I think that they've done, the Braves have done this a lot the last few years where they've just made a position of strength even stronger and it's played off. It's played out really well for them. And then Alex is doing it from experience. They did it in 2020. He had that pin that was so good that remember they went into the, the 2020 postseason with Max Fried and three rookies made all the other starts, yeah. yep. three rookies. They ended up pitching their asses off until you got to the end, you know, until a couple yeah. of bad ones. But they were they pitched great. But that pin was there to save them. They could go three innings, get them out. 
Then, then they had payroll. They just cut payroll for 2021. So they couldn't bring back Melanson and they didn't bring back O'Day. Penn wasn't quite as deep, but it got by. But as Alex pointed, they got by in the postseason because he had off days. So you could ride those same three guys. Can't do that during a regular season. No, there's going to be less off days this year too. Exactly. There's not going to be many off days at all. There's going to be double headers, three double headers. So this is a great year to go extreme with the bullpen especially since you're not sure about the fourth and fifth guys like you, as you would like to be, you don't have, you have a fourth guy that, you know, a Grinky or somebody. So you're, you're really, I think he really covered their ass as well with this, by doing this. And you couldn't have done this unless you really boosted the payroll because we thought they were done spending. Yeah. After they got McHugh Thought he might save the rest for mid season ads or maybe a cheap starter. Then he goes out and spends 16 million on Kenley Jansen. So your net, your payrolls now is close to 170. The highest in franchise history was going to be 150 in 2020 before the pandemic and the prorated salaries, but they would have been 150 that year. And then they cut it a little bit the next year. By the end of last year, it was back up to 150. But you're starting out at 170, man. That's a, that's quite a bit. They can't be accused of being cheap now. I mean, no. we're being fair to them. You can't really say they're being cheap because now they're up where I thought they, I thought all along they should be about 180 now after winning the World Series. Yeah. 170, they're like seventh best in baseball, and they're ahead of teams like the Giants, who are a cash cow, the Cardinals, who have a, a lot of money, spending as much or more than the Angels, right there with the Phillies. Yeah. Really, you're only behind, you know, the New York teams, uh, the White Sox, the Dodgers, I think the Red Sox, maybe. Yeah. I mean, the legit teams that have a ton of money. So they're, yeah. they're doing what they needed to do after winning the World Series. I think they really are wanting to – they know how good it was for business. They've seen the, the the attendance spike and all that. The season tickets are all sold. Premium seats are all sold. I think they want to try to win it again, man. And they, I think they've got a legit chance. <laughs> I mean, if, if Acuna comes back. Yeah. Ozuna. Ozuna rakes. He looks pretty good. He looks, he's in belt, much better shape than he was in last spring. No pot belly, nothing. Yeah, I mean, this – they didn't. There's not really an area you can look at and say they got significantly weaker. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we love Freddie. We wanted him yeah. to break. We thought they should have resigned him, but the guy they brought in is the one guy we said, yeah. If you don't get Freddie, you got to get Olson. I thought they yep. gave up too much to get him, but I think Alex knew all along they could resign him because he'd made pretty clear they have the same agent. Uh, Olson has the same agent as you know. BB Abbott is Chipper's best friend, right? Chipper talks to him all the time. He's told Chipper many oh, times over the years that yeah. Olsen would love to play in Atlanta. So even if they didn't directly tell Alex he'll play, they Chipper knew. told him that he'll sign. And that deal they gave him, dude, is another really team-friendly deal. If Olsen just plays like he has, he doesn't need to get any better. It's extreme team-friendly if it is. He peaks at $22 million, dude. $22 yeah. million for him, $17 million for Acuna, $7 million peak for Ozzy. Those three guys, 46 million, three all stars who could hit 30 to 40 bombs, 25 at least for Ozzy. Yeah, I'd be surprised if anybody doesn't, you know, all those projections come out and people predict who's going to win the NL East if they're not the favorite this year. I mean, you got to be crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that they've, uh, they've done a hell of a job putting it, putting this team together. I mean, uh, sure, something's going to go wrong. Somebody's going to get hurt, but I think, yep. uh, you know, I thought they handled the the uh, the the Freddie thing bad for a year because they wanted to wait and see how much money they made, and then they waited too long to make him a legit offer. But they did the one thing they could do to recover by getting a guy that I mean, if I'm being honest, I I, I love Freddie and I wanted him back. But five years from now, I think they're gonna be better off with this guy, man. This guy's five years, four or five years, four and a half years younger. He's a stud. He keeps himself in great shape, and he's also really personable and a great guy in the clubhouse. I met him, and he's really good dude. Yeah, I liked him. I liked him when I was rehabbing down in uh, Stockton with him. I just thought he was mature and had yeah. his head on straight. You know, you never know with prospects, but he's had a good career so far. Seems like a good dude from Atlanta. I mean, it's it's like you said, it's the one thing they could have done that would have yeah. made me question at least whether letting Freddie go was the right move. You know, I mean, if you would have told me they weren't going to sign Freddie back. Yeah. I couldn't have drawn up any scenario other than this where it'd be like, yeah. 
All right, let me think Nobody about that. else. Nobody else. Rizzo, any of those would have been a huge step down. And I'm told this guy can pick it better than anybody right there with Freddie or better defensively. Yeah. Well, his defense is that, – that was the thing I didn't know yeah. about him. I mean, you, you watch highlights, you're going to see him hitting home runs. Yeah. But until you watch a guy play for a full season, it's hard to appreciate their defense. And that's what we always said about Freddie's is he's underrated. Right. But Olsen's is – I mean, all those stats and, and the defensive statistics for him say he's – pretty damn close to elite if not elite yeah yeah he's they said he's t- incredible picking it to chapman yeah. and he said Ch- chapman said he's saved his ass a lot but i mean look at their defensive numbers he had to do a lot to, a lot to do with that so um man the stories that came out about freddie i mean we always knew there was something going on and you know people that if you've actually off the record talked to people about what was going on and how and as it comes out, I mean, the Braves just did not make him. They made him an early offer last spring, but it was like a fa- – it wasn't a real offer. It was kind of here's what we're interested. They yeah. didn't make him a real offer till after the All-Star break. And even then, they sat on that for a long time and did not raise it until, you know, you come back from the lockout. I mean, they raised it right before the lockout, but it still wasn't nowhere near Freddie, what Freddie wanted, and they weren't going to budge off the five years. But you got it up to 140. And at the end, they raised it to four and forty-five. Um, if they'd have given that to Freddie a year, fourteen months ago, coming off the MVP year, he would have taken five years, one forty-five. I would think so. I think yeah. so. But after he took all that risk on and answered all those questions and had another big year, I could see wanting more. I just think his agent did him a real disservice, man. Yeah, I think that's probably where the blame falls. Um, you know, I mean, if if you're him. I think it's unfair to look at the overall contract he wound up with and, yeah. and compare, you know, after taxes, the values and everything because deferred. The, well, the contract he wound up with though was after losing his biggest bargaining chip. I, exactly. You know, I mean, he maybe he gets another 30 if the Braves wait another week and the Dodgers feel like they're competing with somebody. Right. But once the Braves were out of the picture, you know, it, it's kind of tough to to use any team to leverage it up. Yeah. And and losing them and that trade happening probably, you know, realistically cost him quite a bit. But if you're Freddie going into this offseason, winning a World Series, you got an MVP under your belt, you've played the way he has, you know, he's never had a bad year. No. You're thinking, why couldn't he have gotten 200 or, or more? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's what his agent was expecting. You get out on the market and really drive the money up. But once you lose the Braves, it's it's like the Dodgers can just sit on their hands and say, you know, come see us when you're ready. Here's where we're at. Yeah. And he was in a bad spot, kind of like Korea, where it wasn't Korea had didn't have the market that he should because he should have got a lot more. But Boris, being a freaking genius, gets him this deal with the twins who nobody saw coming. But the average annual value, he's getting 35 million. He has a good year. He can just say, I'm opting out and I'm back on the market. I mean, Boris does I what he what he was able to do with these guys. But I thought Freddie Chipper had some great things to say in that interview he did with uh with the guys back in atlanta um on 680 i thought that was really good um he pointed out that he told freddie before the lockout said if you go to the lock if you go to free agency or i'm sorry back in august when they raised the thing to like 140 he told him if you go to freddie if you go to free agency you're not coming back because he told basically was saying there's gonna be some other teams come in and all this yep and then he gave his he gave him and his he said he warned Freddie and he said don't play the Braves because yeah. they're not going to put that Alex will not do it. He said he warned him. So then they said they were blindsided when Alex all of a sudden they gave him this ultimatum, which I thought was just bullshit. If that's I can't believe somebody made that up. So I'm I'm assuming it's real. Right. But they gave him an ultimatum of take six years, what one sixty five I think it was, or seven years one eighty five or once you think that was it. And you got one hour to decide. You can't do that to a guy like Alex. He's right. not going to do that. He's what are you doing? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to answer your ultimatum. Get one hour. You got to negotiate, man. Well, and just think about all the time they lost with the lockout. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's. It's easy to blame days. his agent or blame anybody else, but that's you know. The blame it's, goes around. It goes around. It goes everybody, around. everybody, the team's got some of it for waiting to see what their profits were going to be. And then when they did see after that first quarter, I and mean, we saw that for the second quarter, I mean, the profits, the turnaround was huge. They could have made the offer then. They didn't have to wait till the third quarter. Yeah. It's funny, though. You know, I was a free agent, a courtable free agent one time. 
You know, I was a free agent plenty of times where it was like I was just begging for a deal. But after, you know, having pretty much five solid years in Atlanta and having Tommy John, um, I hit the market as a free agent. But a lot of teams still wanted me because I pitched so well and they figured when I come back, I could be good. And it, you know, I wouldn't hear from my agent for a month and a half. I'd hear, you know, hey, the Orioles are talking about maybe possibly doing a three year deal with you. Yeah. I'd be like, hey, great, let's do it. I'm in on yeah. a three year deal, you know, coming off of Tommy John. Yeah. And I just wouldn't hear from my agent again. And I text him three weeks later, I'd say, you know, what happened with this? And he'd just be like, ah, I didn't, they don't want to do it now or something like that. Yeah. And then it'd be the White Sox are thinking about two years or three years. Would you be interested in playing there? And I start kind of calling around and then I just never hear back from him on it. And it's, it's kind of, you know, nerve wracking as a player. You're sitting there and you're wanting these updates from your agents and there's no update. There's nothing happening. And, you know, I think in, it's easy to blame Freddie, but he might have been in the shoes where he just trusted his agent. And when you hear the team called once or the team called twice, you know, I'm sure there was teams that called and my agent was like, ah, that's a bullshit offer. I'm not even going to throw this to him or we don't want to yeah. do it. Um, I don't know what the communication between Freddie and his agent is or how much trust right. he put in him, how needy he was as a client. Cause I started getting antsy, but I was trying to let my agent do his job. So I stayed off his back. But at the same time, it's like three weeks gone by since we heard from this team and I was excited right. about it. And then nothing's ever on the table right, again, right. you know, so it could have been something with the Braves where maybe they call more than, than it seems like to Freddie, but it's the same it's the same contract offer there. Everybody's right. in the weren't same mo- They weren't moving from it. So he doesn't forward that information to Freddie. You know, I mean, it's, you know it's really hard. It's I hard to how, estimate what that would be. I know care how careful Alex has been because of the problems they had with Coppola. They're being really careful about all these rules. The free agent rule. The other day when Alex was crying, we brought almost to an edge of tears talking about Freddie. He couldn't name he wouldn't Freddie. Say why. He couldn't say it because there's a rule you can't say you're out of the bidding or even indicate you're out of the bidding right. for a free agent because even if it's as obvious as that was right. because the players union would say you're hurting the guy's value. Well, that's yeah. what they were doing, but they couldn't say they it. Even though everybody yeah. knew. So Alex though was scrupulous about following all these rules. So I can see that Alex would not have called his agent during, I can believe during the right. 99 yeah. day lockout because what could happen? Say it went sour and, the, and they got pissed off. They could report Alex that he contacted yeah. us and try and then get him in trouble again. So they want to make sure they don't get in trouble. So it's probably frustrating to the agent that they haven't contacted him. And here's the still this last offer that they made, still nowhere near what we want. And they had talked to the Yankees before the lockout too. So they knew they were interested, but the Yankees didn't make, they couldn't go a long-term commitment like that because they've got Stanton and Judge and these long-term yeah. commitments. They wanted lower. So, like I was saying, he just didn't have the market like Correa did not have the market right now. It was not an ideal time for Freddie to hit the market coming off two great years like yeah. he did. And he didn't have the time. You know, you couldn't have predicted when you're turning down whatever yeah. extension, if they made a realistic extension offer and it's a year short, because he seemed pretty set on the six years. You know, that was yes. a big thing to him. But even if they made him a good five year and he wants to weigh whether or not he's taking it, you're assuming you got your agent has three right. months that they lost to work on it, you know, and call the teams and, and see where we're at. And maybe something's changed. Can we go up a little bit? Or maybe we'll come down a little because the market's not what we thought. All that was condensed to a week. Yeah. And when they said they were blindsided by the trade, well, that's what Chipper warned them about. Alex does yeah. not mess around. And Freddie has seen enough of Alex to know that. When this guy's ready to do a deal, he does the deal. This dude does not mess around. When he's time decides we're not getting this done and I'm not going to get caught with my pants down and miss Matt Olson because that's the only way I recover. we got to get Matt Olson. So Alex's man, he is really careful to make sure he's not caught. You know, we got to have a backup plan. If if you don't, if you think there's a chance you're not going to sign Freddie, which when you go into realist, you know, free agency with any free agent, it's realistic. They could be gone. You got to have that backup plan. He probably had that trade on tap. And right. once he got the ultimatum, just hit the button. And so if the Padres call and they offer, you know, or Tampa Bay calls because they were interested in Freddie, if they call for Matt Olson because they got more prospects than the Braves do, they might be willing. Yep. If they call all of a sudden, Oakland's going, we'll take that one. And then he screwed on that. It's like, okay, now we got to pay Freddie. So, right. And, and that's another thing him. that, you know, you don't have time for those trades to develop and lose right. Matt Olson. And Freddie side normally. can say, well, you know, you're not getting him now. So, right you want to meet our price or not. Just none of that had any time to develop with the lockout. And it, I think more than anything, when you're looking at Freddie's deal and the value he got and everything, it, more than anything, it's unfair to say 
re to really criticize any part of it if you don't consider that there wasn't an offseason for any of this to develop. You know, right. I mean, I don't think anybody foresaw how this offseason went and and how you could have negotiated anything. So they come back. The ultimatum they gave them was supposedly, reportedly, five years, one sixty-five million, or six years, one seventy-five. Well, when they gave them that one-hour ultimatum, I'm sure Alex is like, "What do you do? Give me a one-hour ultimatum?" And two, I'm not getting, I'm not paying it close to any of those contracts. Right. We made our offer, and it's not even close to that. So obviously, this is not going to happen because we're not going to meet. You know, that you guys are going up, and we're going, we're staying the same. And so, I mean. That's terrible negotiating, though. I, I've never heard of an agent giving telling a GM you've got one hour to accept one of these two deals. Yeah, and, uh, what GM is going to go? Okay, we'll take that one. No, none of them, especially when well, you've got an option to go with Matt Olson. And that's who wants I, to be here badly. Maybe that's what they didn't see. You know, I mean, maybe they didn't see that coming. I, I, I saw Freddie's dad's quote that he was shocked when the trade happened, yeah. and that's why I asked what the communication is because. You know, even if you're Freddie and you really want to be in Atlanta, you know, you're going to let his, your agent do his job. And and you put a lot of trust in your agent. You know, I mean, there was yeah. there was just like there was off seasons for me where I got offered one point five in my first time being a free agent. And my agent said, no, just wait. Yeah. And I was like, man, this is guaranteed money. My elbows busted up. Yeah. Well, four months later, Oakland comes calling and they offer me seven million. You know, so it's it's like you do put a certain amount of trust in your agent to do their job. Yeah. But it, you wonder if if he'd been told, well, they got this Olsen trade on tap. So is it worth 10 million less for you to stay in Atlanta? How bad do you want to stay there? If he was ever really given the decision to to make that choice. Yeah. It's like Chipper, Chipper man. I thought Chipper nailed it, though. If you're Freddie and Chipper has told him, you know, because they've talked about this so much and he wanted to stay here like Chipper did. And that was genuine. Yep. These people on Twitter are saying, you know, he didn't want to be, he did want to be here. He, yeah. I know it doesn't look like that when he ends up taking six for 162 from LA. But like you said, they didn't have any leverage anymore. Yeah. He takes six for 162, like 50 of it or so are deferred. It ends up being worth like 140 if this is right. Kenny's, Kenny yep. Rosenthal's looking into it, but it's like 140 and that ends yeah. up being less than what the Braves did because of the, the, the uh, higher taxes out there. Yeah. So, I mean, it just, I feel bad for Freddie. I really do. But he, Freddie, at some point, you got to tell your agent, you got to tell Casey close, get the best deal you can get for me to be in Atlanta period. Let's get this done. That's yeah. what you got to tell him, right? Yep. Get the best deal you can do for Atlanta. I'm tired of waiting. I'll take it. Let's do it. I want to be there. Yeah, I would think I would think he would have said that at some point, and maybe that's yeah. when the ultimatum came out. <laughs> yeah, you know, he, he, that, that was his answer. last. That was his ace up his sleeve that didn't work. Well, if that yeah, if that was how Casey took a directive from Freddie, get me the best deal in Atlanta. His directive was to go to <laughs> Alice and say, "You got two choices. You got an hour." But this is this is why agents matter so much, because you know if you have a guy like Boris or or Danny Lozano, um, that Freddie might not be signed yet. They might wait and say, you know, remember the year Prince Fielder waited until yeah. oh, somebody got hurt with the field. Tigers or the or he went straight to the owner yeah. and, and he wound up getting the deal. And everybody's like, man, Boris got so lucky. But it's it ain't it's lucky such to a, keep doing it. No, it's not. But it's such a dangerous game to play. That tell Boris you, is always willing to play I'm, that game. I'm telling you, yeah. You say what you want about Boris because he always gets the – he almost always gets the highest – Yep value contract or gets creative and does what he did with right Correa. with Correa. And he could have done something like that with Freddie too, with opt outs, yep. you know, but here's the thing is if you're not going to get the best contract and get your play, your play, because BB Abbott is great at get, I think BB Abbott's a perfect agent for me for the time. I, he gets the players where they are comfortable yep. and where they're going to be happiest. And it's not always the, you know, the huge deal, the, the yeah. jaw-dropping deal. But He negotiated this contract with Alex in like 10 hours, man. An yep. eight-year extension for this guy. Because yep. he knew he wanted to be here. He stayed up all night with Alex doing this. And he got it done before they introduced him the next day. Because Alex said, we want to get this done before we introduce him tomorrow at 1 o'clock at our already scheduled introductory thing. We'd love to get this extension done. And they got it done. And they to dropped me. it for the for the interview. Yes, he was yeah, ready when cool. he came in and introduced yeah. him. They just announced it as he's walking in that we signed him to an eight year, hundred and sixty eight million dollar extension, like the largest extension in franchise history, largest contract in franchise history, with a ninth year option at twenty million, could be worth eight hundred eighty six. So, but I, I just thought that uh, 
I just thought the way if 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 you're not going to be like Boris and get the best the most money you can, be creative, whatever. Then Put get him where your, he wants to be. Yes, but don't be yeah. somewhere in between where you get him nothing. You get him neither the best money or the place he wants to be. That's just a fail. Yeah. So I, I think so. I mean, I, I, think, I, think, I think that Freddie's. I don't think Freddie's agent did him right, man. The only reason I can't be extremely critical is because of the lockout. You know, not having yeah, that, that time to it did. those it's, extra three agent. months to play this game are huge for agents. And I'm sure and his agent had so much time. There's so much buildup that he wanted to do right by Freddie, you know, and so much spotlight on it. Probably felt bad for Freddie for not getting an offer. He's probably pissed at the brace for not making an offer, yeah. you know. So he's thinking we're going to be tough, you know, but it just backfired, you know, because it just picked the wrong guy coming off a World Series championship. And the Braves are like a little full of themselves and they're rightfully so. And they're like, hey, we love Freddie, but he ain't bigger than the franchise. And we got this option. If they didn't have Matt Olson option there, I think they probably would have caved to take that ultimatum and yeah. got one of those two. But they did have this option. Well, who knows if they actually had the number they you know, how much they knew about the number it was going to take to sign Olsen, you know, because they, I'm sure they knew what it was going to take to, to get him. Yeah. But they might've known, I mean, they might've known 162 for Olsen for, or for eight years, 68 for eight years, 168 for eight years or, or Freddie for six. They started at 140, I think with Olsen for like uh, seven years. Yep. They took it up another year and another 28 million. So they brought up the AV and went longer and they got creative and added that. And, and once again, Alex with the, with the, with the options with no buyouts, he's like the right. king of these options with no buyouts, man. And if he had that in his pocket the whole time, you know, why, why would you budge? Yeah. If you, I if think you can they look were at confident. that deal and say that puts us in the same position. Yep. They were confident that also wanted to be in Atlanta. They just bought, they got married in August or they closed on a house in August in Atlanta, in the side of the perimeter, and they got married in November. His wife's from there too, Johns Creek. Her family's from there too. They both wanted to be there. They, they and the Braves knew this. So if you don't have to go buy a second house and move, and you can live year round, oh my God, they valued that. So yeah, and they could have known that last spring. You know, the whole time we're analyzing, you know, are they going to sign yeah. Freddie back? Are they going to do this? They could have had that pretty much lined up in their pocket the whole spring, the whole year. I'm sure the Braves were fully aware of everything in Olsen's private life because of the fact that BB is yeah. Chipper's best friend and he's Olsen's agent. So, but it worked out for the Braves, it worked out for Olsen. I feel bad for Freddie, but you know what? Freddie's going to be happy out there. He'll be fine. Freddie's living at home in Corona Del Mar. He'll get an apartment downtown so he didn't have to go back every night, you know, day game after night game and all that. But uh, he's living in Corona Del Mar. They don't have to move now to another city. He's playing for the freaking Dodgers. It's not like he's stuck in, you know, wherever. Did, yeah. Cleveland. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're going to be competing just like the Braves are for championships every year. It's, it's just, just too a, bad there's got to be any bitterness or, or right. You know, and he's bit. not, and he did trash his legacy to a degree. He's still going to be beloved, and the, the people are going to get past this in a year or whatever or less. Yeah. Some people are not even going to have a problem with it right away. But long term, they're going to get cheering for Freddie when he comes home. Maybe not this year. Some people won't, but oh, he's not going. Yeah. But he's not going to be the Chipper Jones with a, with the number retired. And one of the guys, like you know, the all-time guys, he's not. His number should his number should be retired. But I was talking about this the other day with Bo. How do you retire Freddie's before Andrew Jones? His is not retired yet. Good point. Andrew Jones, ten straight Gold Gloves, four hundred some home runs. You know, I think you got to retire Andrews at the same time you do Freddie's or before. And Andrew might go in the Hall of Fame. They've got a few years. They've got a few years to do that. And if it, well, if Andrew goes in the Hall of Fame, they're going to retire. Don't retire. <laughs> you do have to retire then. So yeah, but they should have probably thought about that before. But you can still retire it. So, but I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know how you could justify retiring Freddie's before Andrews. They didn't give five away this spring, did they? <laughs> no, thank you. That would have been. What if they'd have given it to Matt Olson? <laughs> no, they didn't. They did Andrew though. They hit the year after he left. They gave his twenty-five away. That's crazy. And they didn't offer him a contract to stay. So, anyway, weird spring, but, you know, I, I, I'm i pulling for Freddie to go out there and have a big year. God forbid he goes out there and struggles, you know. I do not I do not want to see that happen. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. No, I don't either. I think he'll have a big year. I just hope he does. I just hope it works out well for him because I know uh, – 
because th- everybody that doesn't know him assumes that he was getting greedy. He didn't like that, man. No, it's, he if, wanted it was, to stay. if this was up to him, he would have stayed and got it done. And I think he really was surprised. I think his agent probably told him, you know, we're going to have a chance to match the offer. Ultimately, we'll take, you know, a little less if we need to. Didn't come to that, though. Alex said, no, I don't have time for you guys. I got a lot to do this week. And he did. He kept doing shit after that. So they got the Freddy thing. They got the Olsen done on Monday, right? So with that, what does he do? Signs Eddie Rosario. Great signing, bringing him back. Yeah. Great deal. Great deal. Got him a good deal, too. Nine million a year for two years and third year option. McHugh, we talked about him. Great signing. And then Kenley Jansen. I mean, they had a hell of a week, man. Yeah. Yeah, I think overall, I just I think that, you know, before any fan wants to be frustrated or angry at Freddie or judge his situation, you know, I mean, it's just you yeah. just got to consider that, you know, maybe the communication just wasn't there. And then when he Weird. winds up signing Obviously. for less overall dollars or whatever with the Dodgers, you know, I mean, he lost his biggest bargaining chip. So, yeah. I mean, just just a weird situation and it sucks. But. I mean, he should never. Fans should love him for life. If you're, if you're a Braves fan, he, he stuck through that whole rebuild without ever yeah. complaining. Was the ultimate company man. Got you a World Series. Got you a World <laughs> Series. Always had to make sure that guys busted their ass, were held accountable, played every day while a little hurt, whatever. Respected the manager. I mean, he kept that clubhouse together, man. Yeah. And, yeah, he shouldn't uh, be the bad guy in this. You know what? I was shocked at how serious Tampa Bay was with for Freddie. They were really serious. Really? Yes. Multi-year, they were serious. It's a tough I place to – I wouldn't want to play in that dome over no, LA. Oh, man. But, yeah, they were serious. But, anyway. Um, so, we're, dude, we're less than uh, – we're two and a half weeks from opening day. It's <laughs> crazy. Isn't that crazy? And a lot – most of the brace starters haven't even pitched – most of their pitchers haven't even pitched yet. It's been minor leaguers in the first couple of uh, games mainly. They started working the guy, the real guys in today. Saw Massick today. Uh, Max Fried will start tomorrow. Charlie pitched a sim game today. Great news for Braves fans is Charlie looks great. I mean, he doesn't even look like he has any ill effects. So I think uh, I was looking at it, timing it out today, looking at every five days. The way they got Max Fried, the way he's lined up, would start opening day. The way they have it lined up, it looks like they would slot Charlie in the back and give him an extra like four or five days, but he wouldn't miss a start. He started at the back of the rotation to begin. The, that's what it looks like to me. So he he's one of those guys that I don't worry about. Yeah, I mean it's just it, like for him, he's not a big weightlifter, right? He's not doing anything. Right. He doesn't need a full off season to generate power. It's just the way his levers work is just built perfectly for being a pitcher. So if yeah. he can just be healthy and feel good, he's going to pitch well. Ian looks good. Uh, Luke Jackson, by the way, is in great – man, he looks great. He's in great shape. Really? Lost some weight. Yeah, he lost some weight. You know, pitched great last year, but he lost some weight. Uh, Tyler looks great. I mean, all those dudes look the same. Uh, Bullpen's fired up. I thought I thought Will Smith, man, that was pretty damn – pretty damn team first cool the way he handled the Kenley Jansen thing without – That's how it should be. Because you could, you could be a little chapped. The first year you Melanson saved after you said gave him that contract, and he set up Melanson without a no complaints whatsoever. Then yep. he comes in, gets booed last year, responds by keep pitching his ass off, pitches great in the postseason, doesn't give up a run, was perfect. And then the third year of the contract, they bring in Kenley Jansen at you know two weeks before spring before the season, and he said, "Hey, I loved pitching the ninth. I had fun doing it, but if you think this makes us better, bring him in. I'm all for it." Well, That's it makes cool. him it makes him so much better in in a in another way too is they can match up in the eighth now. Yeah, you know, and, it, and he can have some backup, or you can you can throw him in. Yeah. I, you know, I don't I don't know where he draws the line on anything for the team. If you start bringing him in the fourth or fifth inning, yeah. he's going to be happy. Well, he said he'd be happy if I need to pitch sixth, seventh, and eighth. I'll do it, no problem. Yeah, no, well, that's what he said. He told Snit. So, so you got three lights out lefties and three lights out righties. You can mix and match anytime you want. I mean, that's a manager's dream. Yeah. 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 They got some studs. No doubt. They just need to stay healthy and everybody so far are healthy. So it's going to be cool to, to watch, man. It's going to be interesting. I think they really have a shot if everybody stays healthy that uh, the chemistry is, seems great again. I mean, it's early. I haven't seen much, but uh, Acuna looks great. Acuna's in good shape. Looks like, uh, if anything, he lost a little weight, but. It's on crush a ball the other day off the scoreboard, left center. Crushed it. Looked over at us. He goes, I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, 
He's special. I, I think they're going to let him DH in, in April, I think, before they let him play in the outfield in May. I think he's going to DH in April. And play right field when he comes back. And play right field when he comes back. Yep. They got Deval in center. You got Rosario. Can play left. You got because once Acuna gets back, I think Ozuna's going to be in a DH role every day, yeah. which is where it should be. Yeah. Got some other guys battling for, you know, extra outfield spot. Got some good guys battling for the utility infield spot. They brought back Goose Goslin. They got Brock from the, the from the Red Sox, who was Brock Holt, who was really good for the Red Sox as a utility guy. They got some good candidates for the utility last utility spot behind Arcia, who's back. So yeah, they been, just they keep bringing in good what what seem like good dudes at least. Yeah. You know, I mean it's yeah, you can usually tell who the turds are by watching TV and the highlights yeah. and how their teammates react to them. But a lot of the guys they bring in, you know, you've watched them, you've just seen the things fan bases have said about them when they left, yeah. and, like, and the yeah, teammates like Brockle, say about yeah. them. Yeah, like a Brock Holt type of guy. That yeah, you know what's amazing, Goslin. You look up his stats last year. He played for the Angels. Played on a team with with the guys that they've got, Shohei and uh, and, and Trout before he got hurt. Goslin hit clean up like 20 some games last year for the angels. <laughs> I wouldn't plan on that this year. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. The middle of your lineup is not lacking for guys for options with Riley doing what he did last year with Rosario doing it with Ozuna back with Acuna. Yeah. It's, it's, and now with Olsen, obviously, and Olsen's back clean up in third for, for the A's. So you're going to have him at either third or fourth. Yeah. Yeah, he's gonna interesting have to, yeah, split up your righties. Plenty of thump around him. Man, he's a presence in a in a box, dude. That, I've that, seen some of the highlights, you know, just as even in live live at bats and yeah. stuff, hitting taking some pretty good pitchers deep. That stance he's got and puts the bat out there like he does. Yeah. Big dude. The most for me, the most impressive thing is that 22 homers off of left-handed pitching. Isn't that something? I mean, I just I saw his stance, and I'm thinking, you know, you could probably get down and into him as, as a lefty and, and get him out front on a slider off of that. Yeah. And then we started talking about his lefty lefty numbers, and I asked it, him about it. What do you say? Said he just sees. He goes, I don't know. I get in a really, I get in a, in a groove where I'm, I really see lefties well. And I said, Cliff Floyd used to hit lefties really well, really yeah. well, like better than righties. And Cliff used to tell me that he liked hitting lefties because it forced him to keep his shoulder in. Yeah. He couldn't fly open. He well, that's that. Joey Votto. Joey Votto. I yep. mean, you throw you if you throw a breaking ball first pitch that starts at a lefty and comes mm -hmm. over the plate, you know you're safe. Eighty percent of the time, it's going to be a free strike. Mm -hmm. But the Joey Votto, Chase Utley, the guys that keep their front shoulder in, you know they and they're willing to just spray a ball to left. Freddie, you know Freddie's really good at it. Yep. The guys that just the only place you can pitch a guy like that is a sinker down and in lefty lefty that you know you're probably safe and they have to hunt that and look for it when they keep their shoulder in on breaking balls. Yeah. They can cover the fastball away. And if you look at a normal lefty lefty pitch mix, it's fastball down away, fastball down away. And I'll see if they'll chase a slider. Yeah. You can't do that to guys like Joey Votto because they're all over it. You know, you have to make them aware inside and most lefties just, they're just not conditioned to make that pitch, right? you know, consistently to pitch a lefty lefty in. It's a hard pitch to throw, but I mean, if Olsen can do that, if he can stay in on lefty breaking balls and force them to make, you know, pitches, mm -hmm. quality fastball in pitches, they're going to miss in there too. So, I mean, it's guys that do that are so tough and there's very few lefties that, that actually are good at that and do it. Yeah. Yeah. What an ideal guy to split up the righties they're going to have. They're going to be there. Yeah. That's a hell of a lineup. It's potentially a better lineup than last year. Now with the Zuna back with the Cunha back. Yeah. You know, with Rosario for a full season because he hit like crazy down the stretch, and with Olsen replacing Freddie, I mean, their numbers were he, he actually had better statistics than Freddie last year, as great as Freddie's were. So yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting, man. The hell, I hate, I hate giving it credit. I hate giving this move credit, but yeah, it's hard to hard to argue with. Yeah, one thing that we said he could do if he yep. didn't get him, he had to get Olsen. Well, he got him. Gave up a hell of a lot too, man. Langolier shocked me. I did not think they trade him, but like, what's the said, point of having all these guys? Right, exactly. Though? You know, if you're not eventually going to do something yeah. like this and and go for it. Pache said they would trade. I thought they would trade Pache, and they did. But I thought that uh, I thought Langolier's was the second most untouchable, which he was. They wanted Harris or Langolier's. So you're not getting Harris. Yeah. But, but the A said we got to get one of those guys. So.
they had to do it. And Cusick might be great. He might be an ace. He's got a great arm, but you know about pitching prospects. Shit, how many of those guys end up working out and don't get hurt? Shit, we're talking about five of them every spring. Yeah. You know, I mean, that yeah. that's when you're in the big leagues, you hear about all these prospects. You're like, I yeah. don't care what you do in spring training. Yeah. I don't care what the scouts say about you. I don't, I don't care what Baseball America writes. Yeah. You know, when the bright lights come on, can you handle it? And that, that's why I have I have trouble getting too excited about any prospect. You know, you asked me if I could trade Langoliers for Olsen. Right. It's a done deal. And 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 the thing is they've got Darno and uh and uh, uh Manny Pena from Milwaukee. So they signed him for two years to be Darno's backup. Darno signed for two year extension. So they don't have to worry about he wasn't gonna be here for two years unless there was yep. an injury. They got Contreras who played really well for a while last year and he's still really young. Yeah. So he's going to have two years where he's not rushed and he's going to have a chance to really develop. And if they, and if he doesn't, then they go out and get another guy. Get all right, go get a catcher. So yeah, to get Olsen that later, you got a chance to repeat to get Olsen and then sign the extension. Yeah. Well worth trading Langlers for that. And, it, and shit the Cusick as good as, as, as that arm is the fourth, the fourth guy in the trade might end up being a better pitcher than Cusick Estes. This guy yeah. put up really good numbers last year. So in a ball. Yeah. Hi, a exactly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, actually, low A. They were both low A. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we'll do this again uh, at the end of the week, probably. Yeah, do another one at the end of the week after some things happen. Cool. Seems like the dust has settled. I think Alex is done with the big moves, but I think he's still going to make a couple, maybe one or two smaller ones after some guys become available. But uh, if you're a Braves fan, don't get greedy, man. You got to be happy with what the moves he's made. I know everybody keeps going, what's next? What's next? Well, well he, he made a flurry a of moves, man. Now you just let the team settle in and play. It's a damn good team right now. Yeah, it is. It really is. All right, that's it. 755 is real. We'll be back soon. Thanks, everybody.